Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And this is stuff I pulled out of the basement cell at New Dimension recently, Ed. It's kind of a, an annual tradition for me. It always falls around my birthday, so this is what I came home with this time. So this is all dollar stuff, and uh, on the right here are magazine size things, oddball stuff. Uh, we'll kind of we'll run through that first and start with Marvel's answer, I guess, to Mad Magazine and Crack Magazine. This is Crazy Magazine, and I believe this is issue one. Yes, yeah, it says right there. Right. <laughs> no number, but yes. Um, I have not seen this before. I'm, I've heard of it, of course. I may have seen like covers and back issue bins and stuff, but because of the uh, the dollar price, I figured I would pick it up. And it looks exactly like those other magazines, more or less. You know, it's it's totally like that formula. Basil Wolverton, uh, one piece, as far as I can tell, this is the only piece of his that's in here. And before that, man, it was uh, Mike Plug was on duties to be the uh, the more the more uh, Drucker of Kung uh, Fu. <laughs> yeah, and this is your you know like it even follows sort of that format of listing your contributors up front, and so you see. The uh, the Mike Plug, Basil Wolverton, Herb Trimpey. Marie Mer Severin's a good humor artist. Von Baudet. Yeah, so, that's cool. We'll do a flip through here and see uh, see what you find. But I I kind of felt like this was a little bit of a soulless. It's it's just the formula. Yeah, just a cash grab wannabe thing <laughs> with no real energy to it. Peace nuts. Like I don't know, man. Kind of uninspired. Some Fumetti comics. There he is, House Roy himself. <laughs> In the Fumetti. I like this drawing a lot. Shouldn't be seeing cartoonists with their shirts off, man. Very true. Is that John Romita? I don't know if I'd recognize John Romita. You tell me, Ed. Is that John Romita? I don't know young John Romita. No. Actually, I think that's Neil Adams. I might recognize Neil Adams. I think that's Neil Adams. You think? Boom. Neil wow. Adams, boy. Good call. Yeah, young Neil Adams. He doesn't look much different these days. That hair's a little whiter. <laughs> All right, so. Oh, and there's your Von Baudet. Junk waffle. Retained the copyright. Hey, good for him. And a lot of the magazine stuff is very, very random. So, you know, this is stuff I just found in magazine boxes, looked interesting enough to uh, take a flyer on. In most of these cases, I've never seen this stuff before. Can't tell you anything about it. Just mm -hmm. something that was like, well, maybe I'll give that a closer look. This is uh, Shock Therapy, and it is 1979, so kind of a, a weird item. You know, 79, a little before the black and white explosion. I'm not sure why I picked up Roadkill Magazine. I think there's some skateboarding stuff in here and uh, skateboarding comics. If I if I come across them, especially for a dollar, I usually end up bringing them home. But this may be the uh, the extent of the skateboarding stuff. That and the Skate Nazi. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's just a weird anthology. There's some more skateboarding, so... That's probably why I gave that one a shot. This was a this was one I, I debated on bringing home. Basement Comics number one, and this is a the reason I ended up bringing it home is it's 2016, but it is a fanzine. Like it's a it's a fanzine in the very traditional sense of fanzines. You know, different people contributing, um, collector info, and it's old. You know, it's like older guys that are doing it, so it kind of has that old tone. You know, it's like collectors right. that would have been interested in old fanzine info. So I haven't gone through all of this. I've just kind of started looking through it. Kind of interesting. I've become more interested in fanzines, and uh, it's weird to see one from 2016 that is essentially the same formula of old fanzines. Uh, Eclipse Magazine. So a couple reasons that I picked this one up. Uh, Harvey Picar has a piece in here. One of the reasons is Paul Galassi has a really neat page, although it's very short. There's Marshall Rogers. But there's also an ad for Love and Rockets number one. Nice. And I thought that's just kind of cool. Major new comic. From Fantagraphics, they call it. It's not comics experimental. That's interesting. Yeah, so I loved seeing that whenever I was flipping through. And since we're here, this is the Harvey P. Carr story. Yes. I guess that's pretty clear when you see Harvey P. Carr in the panel. Um, 
but also I want to show off, there's your Paul Glacey. And I thought it was interesting just because of the format. Yeah, illustrated picto fiction or something. Yes, as, as Terry Gross might say, trying to talk to uh, Dan Cloud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there was the Marshall Rogers, probably worth a, worth a look. Man, he's like pulling some... Was that Marshall Rogers? That wasn't him. Was this is say, him. Damn. Yeah, that just was... Uh, actually don't know who that was but so eclipse magazine was eclipse's first first publications like it's his first series i don't know how early on it would be i don't know when they started i just don't know the eclipse history that well but this is pretty early you know like to have that love and rockets ad this is 1982 so i don't know when they begin publishing but pretty early on and of course elf quest is represented in everything once elf quest starts i feel like it's in everything New publishers show up, ElfQuest shows up. This is comic media, and again, kind of sticking with that. Not exactly a fanzine, but it's magazines that I don't know about. This is 1973, and uh, certainly looks the part of a fanzine, although there are actual comics being reprinted in here, and it seems like it's a lot of comics that I don't know, and I don't know if they're maybe British. They have a little bit of a, a different feel to them. I love the Seekers logo. I think that's a beautiful beautiful uh, title treatment but this is a you know collection of a few pages of these different strips and then some information interviews with creators stuff like that like that invaders logo also and that totally looks british to me you know in terms of the lettering and stuff and then modesty blaze which is a strip i have a couple of book collections of and i feel like this is maybe an underappreciated strip it's a very strong uh very strong art style who, who are the creators Peter O'Donnell is who's credited with it. I don't know if he's just the writer. Um, I can't make out that artist's name. Jim. I can't tell. But it ran for a long time, you know, and it's kind of in that spy crime genre. Comic Times, same kind of deal. You know, it looks a little bit like a uh, high-end fanzine. And a little bit of comic stuff that I'm just not that familiar with. This is cover dated 1980. Look at that. That was an ad for uh, the Russ Cockrum EC hardcovers. Yeah. Complete Weird Fantasy. It was a second effort, man. That was the first Weird Science. Yeah, and it's Pacific Comics is the address given. So that must be their distributor. You just know, like they, they come out of uh, distributor and turn into publishers. So I think they were always distributing too, as long as they were publishing. Yeah. Man, there's a real cool uh, Bernie Wrightson on that back cover. So, Jim Shooter, uh, Jim Shooter piece. Good interviews with Jim Shooter in the Comics Journal. Like, we're going to have to, there's one from 79, dude, when he becomes the editor-in-chief. And he's like, I'm going to be here for a long time, he says, dude. We're going to have to get into that. I love the pool quote since there's a, a Pittsburgh dropped in the middle of it. I was 18 years old, all alone in the big city. Fresh out of Pittsburgh, having trouble finding a place to live, I just said, "What am I doing here?" So I haven't read this yet, but uh, it should be fun. Like, he's a strange guy. The problem I, I'm always dubious reading his interviews because so much stuff it. gets uh, right. There, that's a good way to say it, Ed. He's a salesman. Yeah, and Don McGregor talking Detectives Inc., which is that Marshall Rogers collaboration. I don't know if that was Eclipse, but uh, yeah, I, th I know it is Eclipse. So, kind of a snapshot of 1980s comics and the Wizard Magazine of 1980. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, do you know Brain Capers? Love it, man. Los Bros does not mean Dos Bros. No, it doesn't. Mario Hernandez, 1993. I had no idea that this was him and, and that he had done a comic completely on his own like this. So, kind of a cool pickup, and I, I am interested to read this one, too. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, whenever he popped up in, in Love and Rockets, like, I always adored his strips, man, and... Uh, I found this pretty pretty late myself, man, and was happy to get a whole book of of his work. Around the time of the uh, hate ball tour, maybe. A little, <laughs> a little mashed up ad with Pete Bag and Dan Klaus. Uh, comic scene issue. I think I picked this up because we've been talking Kirby, and it's, it's Kirby on the cover feature. I think he's talking mostly animation at this point, but uh, kind of a neat eclipse rising a look at the long-running alternative press publisher this is 1982 so you know they've been around for a while at this point apparently carl barks is in here that'll add illumination into their genesis yes yeah it should give give some background on that and i used to love uh comic scene like that was one of my early magazines for comics this looks like an old magazine but uh, i passed by so many of these because the covers were so kind of pristine and newish looking 
uh, that I was just like, oh, this must be like from the speculator boom of the 90s. But then when you open it up, it's like, what? What? I passed all these up? I don't know what kind of cover stock they used or if the... This isn't a badly designed cover, but some of those covers are so badly designed it made me think of like digital fucking yeah. paste ups and stuff. Uh, but yeah, don't don't sleep on this, man. I made that mistake a lot. Yeah, these are I, I would get them when I was a kid, and I don't know why they must have had some newsstand distribution or something that I was able to come upon them. Yeah, Starlog. So Starlog, and then I got rid of them. And then I was like, well, I need to get some of those back. And I have rebought a few. Like, there's one with the Barry Windsor Smith Weapon X that was a big thing for me. Um, but I was at Ides, and, like, they have their dollar magazines. And so I start pulling them out, and pretty soon I had, like, 50 of them. There's a ton of these things. So yeah. they're fun to to, uh, to dig into whenever you get a chance. Um, Acme Comics, 1984. Same deal, man. The fanzine kind of thing is just interesting to me. Oh, to St. Chris Ware? <laughs> It is not. It is not early Chris Ware. But it is, uh, It is. you know, a weird anthology from 1984 that I don't know anything about. Um, love the blue, you know, the blue printing. So it just felt like something to uh, to give a try. I like that cover, too. Pretty interesting. Like, weird yellow and orange. And then this is the same deal. Comic Collectors, Yellow Pages, 8990. I don't know what this is. This is straight up ad zine. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it, Ed. It is an ad zine. It's it's right at the nexus too of go, like go back one. Land of Ooze and Uz. This is the this is the store that uh Eric Reynolds worked at when he was was a kid. Get out. In the shoot interview, man. Go rewatch that shoot interview. I didn't remember him saying that name. That's good 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 pull. Merlin's books in uh in Tampa, Florida area. I don't know if they're still there. I actually I have in-laws around there, so I sometimes go to those comic shops. So it's comic shop ads. It's uh, yellow pages for comic shops. That's fun. Um, yeah. It just felt like a weird object. No doubt about it. Tuck it into my magazine collections of uh, oddball things. Coke Warehouse. Still active today out of Brooklyn. Lots of comics. People pull comics out of there. Cartoons. We did the uh, Alex Toth book recently. One for the Road. That's this is where those ran. Pete Miller does the intro for one for the road editorial coordinator. This is 1963. There's no Toth in it, but I had to get it anyway because it kind of shows you what he would have been up against. And this is I assume that's Pete Miller, um, the editorial guy, I think. But you get to see kind of the different approaches of what cartoonists are bringing to the table, even Fumetti. Yeah, this stuff is so weird. Like, like you know, don't judge me too harshly, but I was in a uh in a Walmart like sometime last year and looking in the magazine section there was like a cartoon like a cartoon uh, magazine that was all comics yeah in Walmart so it has Walmart weird. distribution it's like all these weird car inspired strips uh pretty lazy and yeah you know, it, I, but but th those things have a wider circulation than any comic you or I have ever made. Strange. And some of the stuff's good. I like this. This is probably my favorite of the artists that I see in this issue. Don't know who it is, but I uh, could probably dig a little bit and find them. But I just think it's interesting to think of, like, Toth being in the middle of some of this. And then uh, Mad Super Special, Fall 1986. And I figured if we get into a 1986 tenure, it'll be fun to go through something like this. And if not, I'll just do it on my own. All right, so... Next up are some of the comic books that I pulled out, and actually most of the comic books that I pulled out. Most of them are contemporary 80s, 90s kind of books, with the exception of this old Charlton Romance comic from 1976. And whenever I find those, it's hard to resist them. I like these romance comics quite a bit, and uh, they're harder and harder to find. You know, you don't see them... harder after this video, too. <laughs> well... I don't know. It's just a funny thing. You know, I don't know that they're worth any particular amount of money, especially like the Charlton ones. You just don't see them in back issue boxes, especially like 50 cent boxes that often. I think that the people that were buying these, probably a different group than everybody else who's turning in their Spider-Man comics and stuff whenever they age out of them. And I think these just, they just don't slip into the collections as frequently. So, uh... Sure, can I mention every show we do? This is that second volume. This is issue six. And Ed, you always ask about Reggie Byers. And I said, you know, he doesn't draw this, but you can see like the manga, like they're leaning all in on that manga influence. Hellblazer number 40, Dave McKean. Um, 
does two issues of Hellblazer. One of them is with Neil Gaiman. This is Jamie Delano, the longtime Hellblazer writer. And uh, so I'm, I'm getting it for the Dave McKean art. Even the lettering is really cool. But uh, this is not the one that Neil Gaiman wrote. That right. one was not there. But I like Dave McKean, and I like seeing his pen and ink work. Hellblazer's interesting. As I, as, as I start looking through that, there's like a big run with... Uh, Richard Corbin did like five issues. Like there's a lot of different artists that dip in and out of Hellblazer. Happy the Clown. This is David Mack. Mm. First David Mack, maybe? It's very early David Mack. Artist, cover book designer, and letterer. So uh, <laughs> he's come a long way. It reminds me of Caliber, but I don't believe this is printed by Caliber. I think it might be self-published. And it also is not the easiest thing to track information on. That's interesting. Yeah, he's probably, he's keeping it quiet. He's keeping it close to the vest. Yeah. You're out on him right here. Dedicated to Frank Miller. You can see that he's an interesting graphic artist even at this stage. Oh, definitely. I just saw some Ken Wind on a previous page, by the way. Ken Wind type gimmicks. Yes, very much so. Frank, Frank Miller. Miller. Definitely. That was random. Um, Dark Horse Presents, this is, I think, Volume 3, Issue 3. Pretty interesting table of contents. Dave Gibbons is in this. Um, Paul Chadwick, Howard Chaikin. The reason Richard Corbin's in here, the reason that I buy this is uh, because there is a Jim Steranko piece. And it is a sort of a continuation. Do you remember his book, Chandler? Mm-hmm. There's a continuation of that in here. I think he was supposed to do like either a new a new volume or an updated piece. This is the the Chaken, but I thought the coloring is uh, something to look at. <laughs> so this is the Steranko stuff, and it's Red Tide Chapter One, which again I think was going to be a new volume in that Chandler series that he had done in the '70s, uh, one one book of. I don't know what to make of this. I don't love this stuff. I, I can't tell how much of it. Clearly, some of it's digital and probably him learning the tools. This is from um, 2011. So I applaud him that he continues to work with whatever new media and keep keep learning, but this stuff doesn't really do it for me. But it is fun to kind of look at it and, and think what he's doing. You know, some of the choices that he's making are, are pretty interesting. And then there's a nice interview with him, and he talks about Chandler, the original, the original book. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's here. that's worth that's worth the price of admission. Yes, won't be the last time we probably see that uh, on here. This is a couple issues of Tales of Teen Titans. I think this is the storyline that Deathstroke shows up, and uh, it's George Perez, right? The great George Perez. Right. So I thought I would try it. George Perez was just a little bit before my time, so I was never, you know, I never uh, went back and tracked him down. Obviously, I have a few books of his from you know here and there, but he was never a guy I connected to, and uh, this is something that I often see held up, so I thought I would try it. This is the Spanish artist, Rafa Garis, Garay. We've talked about him a couple times. He's done two Lobo things, and he did a, uh, a drawing board in Wizard Magazine that caught my eye, so I sought out what you know, what other comics he's done. And this is one of them. And the interesting thing here, Ed, this is, uh, this is Duel. Yeah. The, uh, the, the famous Steven Spielberg television movie. So this is like, I don't know if this is a sequel or if it's actually based on that original story as well. This is, uh, Dash Shaw doing Clue. Dash Shaw, very interesting cartoonist. I think he did this last year, maybe early. Yeah, I guess 2019 he did this. So pretty recent. And this is part of IDW, who, uh, you know, like Tom had done G.I. Joe Transformers. They have a big list of licensed properties. And uh, and this is Dash Shaw doing one of those. And there's three issues of this. I think I have another issue tucked in here. He's so interesting. Like his choices for color, too, always stand out to me as being very interesting. Page layouts. Good storyteller. Captain America Special Edition, issue number one. There are two of these total, and these reprint the Jim Steranko Captain America. He did a three-issue run, I think around issues 110, somewhere around there. He did three issues. Uh, this is a cheap reproduction of those, um, and I think we're probably going to visit this again at some point. 
Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I just keep the list of what issues I have, and then if I find one I don't have, I pick it up. I do the same. And uh, this is number 32 from the original Mirage run. Yeah, Mark Bode. I did not have it, so uh, happy, always happy to pick up a new Turtles comic for the collection. Yeah, it's a good one. Mr. Miracle. This is after, long after Kirby. Um, there's a, a run Marshall Rogers does a couple of issues, and then Michael Golden, I think, does the final issue. This is a Marshall Rogers issue. Interesting artist. Um, probably best known for a run he did on Batman. But uh, has quite a few interesting runs scattered around comics. Pretty detailed guy early on before that became the norm. I just love the way his art takes to that paper. Yeah. Batman Black and White. Do you remember this series? Oh, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, me too, and then I got rid of mine. <laughs> so, so I tracked these, you know, I, I picked these up just randomly. I forget what I was looking for. But this first run is incredible. So uh, I'll just read these these credit lists. Walter Simonson uh, on this first story. Richard Corbin, Kent Williams, Jorge Zafino, and Simon Bisley. What an issue, right? Oh, every issue is a banger, dude. Every issue is a banger, man. Oh, Tomo draws one. Yes. So this is the Corbin piece here. Kent Williams. Then they have a little bit of information on the artist himself. Jorge Zafino, big fan of his. Written by Chuck Dixon. Once Chuck Dixon discovered that guy, he, he held on to that dude with, with, with both hands. Hey, I don't blame him, man. I think that guy's amazing. And then this is Neil Gaiman written with uh, Simon Bisley. So that's kind of an interesting piece. Joker's in it. That is interesting because we did wizard stuff where uh, there was mention that they were supposed to do some kind of Batman thing. So it only took, you know, a dozen years for that to come out. This is uh, Klaus Janssen, Libertor, the guy behind um, Ranks Xerox. Yeah. Uh, Matt Wagner, Bill Sienkiewicz, Kevin O'Neill. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dennis O'Neill, Teddy Christensen. More bangers. This first series is really strong, like all the way through, and interesting people. Although, this is the Libertor story, and I'll be honest, I'm a little bit disappointed. This this kind of feels like him somewhat, but it's not the uh, it's not quite what I expect. You know, considering his other work, lots of screen tones, maybe digital screen tones in Matt Wagner's work here. Sienkiewicz. I think Sienkiewicz writes and draws this piece, and it's loaded. Great lettering, of course. And then Teddy Christensen. And they would even have, like, Mark Silvestri inside back covers. You know, like, they really went all out on this series. Yeah, they they were... Like they would Alex Toth cover when and they promoted my, this, they they would just promote it with the credits list. Yes, yeah, for sure. And uh, I love this Alex Ross piece. This is probably my favorite piece. Oh yeah, is. the Brian Bolin story. This is a good story, man. So Bolin, Kevin Nolan has a piece in here. Gary Gianni, Brian Stelfreeze, and uh, Atomo. This is the issue with Atomo. So yeah, the man Bolin is just he's a great figure artist. Mm -hmm. Color and black and white. Like, I always like his covers quite a bit. Kevin Nolan, huge fan. Gary Gianni, Monster Men guy. Yep, said it before. I'll say it again, man. On the very first uh, Fantastic Four letters letters page, he had letters in there, man. So he's <laughs> he's got stripes. That is old school. Stelfreeze is another guy who I always think of, like, the color work that he does is being so amazing. So it's kind of neat to see him in black and white. And then here we go. Atomo doing Batman. Yeah, nice. Like, that's page. incredible, right? It, it even has, like, it, it, it fits in the Akira universe, man. It has, like, you remember when those dudes take the pill and then they get big and buff? Like, it's, <laughs> it's basically that. It's so neat to see his, his version of stuff. Yeah, and this is, you know, a new Otomo comic in, like, the year 2000. That's a really good idea, you know, the bat, the bat on the cloud. And it makes me wonder, like, you know, was he influenced by the Bat manga of the 1960s? Like... This feels so Faust to me, this image. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, I feel like I've seen images that look like that. Even the shadows, you know. It's neat to see this stuff blown up in some of these cases. A um, couple of Clive Barker. I don't know why Clive Barker. Probably all your talk, Ed. All your splatterpunk and violence and stuff, I, I guess, is why this kind of got on my list. Yeah, you know what's funny is I was actually like looking exactly for this. There's several issues. I picked up a couple. These are anthologies, so P. Craig Russell is your first artist here. And uh, Scott Hampton on this second story. And I think these are just adaptations. I don't know that... Uh, yes. From the Books of Blood, his his the the 
anthologies that he started with that sort of made him famous. And these are Eclipse titles. Like, these are really produced. They remind me of the old paperback covers, you know, where they'd have, like, the slightly embossed. Yeah. This one, though, is noteworthy. This is issue two. And I just, like, a lot of this stuff crosses my list, and it's like, well, I want to try it. And that's a good thing for the basement is to kind of, like, dig through and just pull stuff out to test it. The first story is Klaus Janssen. And it looks like Klaus Janssen that I've never seen before. This is Klaus Janssen. I don't know what he's doing. Like, it's clearly some of it's painted, but I think some of it's markers. There's, you know, the hard outlines come and go. They're in parts of it, but not all of it. It's really interesting as Klaus Janssen. Like, even the color palette is is wild. Yeah. So I was pretty excited to see that. I'm, a you know, obviously a fan of his. And this just looks like him taking some chances, doing some different stuff like colored pencil. And I think John Bolton might be the uh, the other story in this particular issue. Yeah, John Bolton. I don't know how many of these there are in all. I usually just buy like one issue or something to sample it. A couple years early Yasagi, the Fanographics, that's issue two, and then the Mirage 1993, and it's in color. You read much of his stuff? I, I confess that I haven't. Yeah, I've, I've just gotten bits and pieces. I didn't know this. I, I've never seen this or didn't realize that it was a real thing and happened upon it. So the Trencher Christmas special. I like Trencher and Giffen's weird, super weird art for it. He did four issues at Image. And then this is, I guess, the one issue he did after Image. But it's still in that style. So kind of a fun pickup. And if we ever actually do some Christmas comic reviews, <laughs> that'll factor in couple issues of one of Farrell Dalrymple's image series, uh, Proxima Centauri. I was flipping through this and just astounded by it. Like, it feels like it's free form and him just going for it. If you've ever, if you follow him and you see, you know, glimpses of his sketchbooks and stuff, he is such a good drawer. And I know I've referenced his lettering a few times and how it's almost like this free form, not laid out neatly lettering, but works perfectly. So I uh, figured it was cool to pick up a couple of these. I fall behind on everything. Like, I'll hear something's coming out, and then I'm not at the comic store, and yeah. I, I don't see it. And... I had a first printing of this from, like, either Study Group or Floating World or something. I, I, is this an Image comic? It is an Image comic. Yeah, I, I swear I have a version of this that's that's before Image. It's I think it's even on newsprint. This is really nice. Kay Fabers, tell me if I'm lying. You know what? There's There was something he did with them. I can't remember the name of it. Was Fight in the title? I think it might have been a different thing this like the first part of that looks very familiar to me yeah yeah this may have come out of that too but anyway i like his work so great to see this was a cool one i've talked about i you know i've been buying tundra stuff whenever i come across it and i found like the list of tundra books they did a bunch of these sketchbooks this is number two in a in a series um but it was filed under fetal brain tango so don't make anything easy kevin <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless this is the john toddleben sketchbook and we'll flip through it because there's just some awesome stuff. So there are notes on what you're looking at too, like brush marker, uh, fine point and brush marker, ballpoint pen, brush marker, acrylic gesso. A lot of it is in black and white, but not all of it. And, uh, and it just kind of shows his range. Some of it's very detailed, pencil sketch, pencil sketch, color pencil on tone paper. Watercolor on illustration board, DeMar Varnish. Like, I don't even know what he's talking about with some of these materials. Figure drawing, life drawing. On black paper. Which is which is crazy if you ever, ever tried it because you, you now have to pull out all the... You have to work opposite to how you usually work, man. Pulling out all the highlights rather than the shadow. So this is the stuff that, that I went nuts for when I started opening it. I think of Toddleben's inking as, as just sublime, mm -hmm. one of the all-time great inkers. And it's because he does this technique of like the lines getting super, super thick where the white almost looks like he's inking with white paint or something. It's incredible to me that he does this. And these are like partially drawn. So you get to see kind of how he would approach inking one of these drawings. I find that just amazing and, and damn well worth the, uh, the price of admission. There's another close-up and you can see it again his approach to texture in some of these inks. I think he's a master with, with black and white and pen and ink. Little uh, HP Lovecraftian figure and then close-ups of some of these details. So close-ups of the eyes. 
kind of an interesting idea for a sketchbook at this time. You period. know, this this is eerie to me too because because he famously at this point he does have like that macular de degeneration and stuff. So like he essentially has to put his nose on the paper while he works. And I just imagine like when he's drawing, he has to see it at this scale in order to generate the the thing that you know we yeah get to enjoy. I wonder if he had like um, one of those you know like a like a, a magnifying glass. You know sometimes right. you'll see the arms with the magnifying glasses and stuff. So this was a fun pickup. I was happy to find this. As I said, a, a Tottlebin fan and, and Tundra. I don't know, man. I'll be I'll be thinking of them and looking at them for a long time. Appleseed Book One, Volume One. I have a few of these scattered around. This just feels like a historic comic, nineteen eighty eight. Something to check out. Yeah, I love the series. I <laughs> this is one of the comics that that uh, like I drew the. Oh like, no way! Yeah, for sure. In fact, I still uh, I still have the cover. Wow, that's awesome. And of course, Masumuno Shiro, um, well known for Ghost in the Shell, but uh, I, I think this stuff was really influential. This was published in 1988, and so it's pretty early for American English manga. And, uh, you know, his stuff, it's, I don't know if this one's Art Adams cover, but a lot of this series would have Art Adams covers. Yeah, this one is not. But whenever you look at his art, you can kind of see how that would make sense. You know, it's very, very detailed. Not that far off from something like a Tomo when you look at some of these detailed city, cityscapes. Oh, for sure. So, I was just saying how influential this would have been in 88. It's like an early manga. Yeah. I think a lot of people that were interested in manga, this is where they started. Um, Amazing Heroes 105. This is one of the uh, the final issues from 1986 that I had needed. So pick that up. This was a fun pickup. This is New Mutants 51. Kevin Nolan cover, pretty cool. Kevin Nolan interior. I had no idea this existed until Saturday whenever I found it. Very excited for that. I like Kevin Nolan a ton. And uh, anytime I can find like a new Kevin Nolan book that I don't know about, I am on board. Not 100% sure, uh, but I think there might be one that Kyle Baker inks. Ah, uh, yeah, I was a little sad. Like, the best is when Kevin Nolan does all the art, including the coloring, but that's not the case here. And uh, I've heard, I think this was a kind of a rush job, you know, a fill-in issue that he had to turn around pretty quickly. So the style is, I guess, maybe a little bit more sparse and open than some of his more rendered stuff. I actually love this. I, I mean, go back one amazing. real quick. That right there is everything to me. Yeah. That with the little polka dot eyes and stuff? Yes. I mean, that, that's Mobius. Yeah, I, I dig this stuff. He's so good, and uh, if this is what fast looks like for him, maybe he should work fast more often. <laughs> Especially if it would result in me getting more of his comics. It's great when you find this stuff, though. Speaking of which, here's another one. Um, I didn't know anything about this. I, I can't even remember how this crossed my... how it came to my attention. But I put it on the list. This is the Action Comics Annual, written by John Byrne, drawn by Arthur Adams. Sign real, me up. Real beefy, uh, bat, the beefiest Batman you ever saw. This reminds me of Swamp Thing, that the Beset era of Swamp Things. But this is uh, Batman and Superman teaming up by Art Adams. Like, how perfect is that? Man, his DC work is a rare morsel, man. Of course, I've gone like 20 pages without a, uh, a Batman <laughs> Superman sighting. Until now. Great sky color. This is pretty unusual. And we pointed out past Art Adams' uh, images where he does this like high angle shot of, say, a room or a setting. And uh, very detailed. Something we'd see McFarlane do in his early Marvel legs. days. Yeah, that's great. I would have been totally on board with that back in the day, and I, I still am. Just has a little bit of a cartoony quality. It's almost the what the version of these characters. It, when, when you get late into a into an Art Adams page count, proportions and stuff starts to change, man, because he really fixates. This feels like a, a pickup from The Dark Knight Returns, the Frank Miller treatment of Superman. So he's done a bunch of those annuals and one-shots. I feel like this is about as good as any of them. It's a pretty nice piece. And part of it is because you get to see him doing the DC big big titans at DC. Yeah. A couple issues of Troy Nixie's Bill the Clown. I had one of them. I think there are three total. Does that sound right? I got the page from this one. This is amazing. Yeah. This, this to me... 
totally in line with all the outlaw stuff with yeah. Joe Vigil with some of your stuff, Ed. Like this, this reminded me a lot of some of your uh, certain little stylistic things. Could be the uh, duo shade, you know, that, that you've been using lately. Um, but really was excited at how good these looked. Wait till they go to the comic shop, man. <laughs> I think it's, oh, a, I think man. it's in that issue. Yeah, yeah. It looks like they're heading there. The treasure chest. <laughs> Nixie's dope, man. It's good stuff. Good cars, like, yeah, I'm on board. I don't know, maybe it's the other issue that has more of the comic, the comic shop stuff. Just a little bit. Yeah, I guess so. My page ain't in that one. I really thought it was. Oh well. Yeah. Unless I skipped it somewhere. And uh, another one. They would do these one shots. Th this was the one that. Uh, I mean, I had this when I was so young and just would draw and redraw these things. Yeah. It just felt demented. Yeah, I agree with you. This one feels like it's it's more stylistic than the uh, than the previous one, just pushing it even further. A couple issues of Judge Dredd from the uh, the Eagle Comics run. These are always fun. Yeah, I like them on that uh, newsprint. And, oh my goodness, is that who I think it is? Uh, no, I think it is. Is that Judge Caligula? Uh, is that Judge? I think it is. And <laughs> let, me see, let, me, let me just see. Because there's, yeah, this is Judge Caligula with his goldfish bowl. <laughs> and uh, do you know the story, Vin? I don't. Uh, okay, in the Mick McMahon story, Mick had to do a rush gimmick with Judge Caligula holding up that uh, fish bowl, and it's a bad drawing, and he admits it, and he shared studio space with uh, with um, Dave Gibbons, and when, and they would they were competitive, and whenever Mick would would uh, be making fun of Dave Gibbons, Gibbons would remind him of his Judge Caligula piece, <laughs> uh, and I guess it might not be in this one, but I bet it, it, if that's twelve, okay, I bet it's issue twelve too. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Judge Caligula holding up the the um, fishbowl, classic image because it's pretty wonky. Another issue of Dash Shaw's Clue. This that's is a McFarlane Spider Man that I didn't have. That's crazy that to 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 find in like a cheapo bin. This is really good too. This is near the end of his Amazing Spider Man run, so he's inking himself, and it's right before the biweekly. I forget what that last uh, big biweekly. There was like a six parter that he drew. I think four or five issues of, but biweekly crazy at McFarlane levels. He had 100 page months. Yeah. So this is kind of like peak Amazing Spider-Man McFarlane. Probably this one and then the, uh, the, the, the Hulk issue. The Cosmic Spider-Man Hulk issue whenever he comes back for one final issue. Yeah. That was a fun find. I have most of those, you know, so like it's another one that I keep the list in my pocket and if I happen to find one, I might have all of them now except maybe a Venom or two. Uh, Rip in Time, Fanagore Press. This is Richard Corbin's uh, self-published line of books and this finishes my rip and time collection i was missing two issues so nice to fill those in and this is a really kind of cool one of these he talks about the um background of how he started self-publishing these might not be this issue but part of it is inspired by the teenage mutant ninja turtle success like he was going through some changes his last book or whatever you know wasn't wasn't landing as well also, I love, like, even the typesetting in these I find to be really attractive. But these are great, and he self-published a lot under Fanagore. So we might have to do, a, like, a dig into Fanagore, because it published for a few years. He did publish, uh, he published graphic novels and comics. He did color comics, and at a very, very high quality level. So definitely worth getting into uh, a closer look at that publisher. <laughs> Here we go. Remember the bad girl trend? This is uh, Schema. I found an ad for this book in some other black and white 80s book. And you never know if those are real or not. But it turns out this is. And uh, it's not a black and white book. This is 1996. And it's it's ridiculous. It's exactly what you would expect from that cover. I just wonder what your wife thinks of that cover, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, uh, I don't think she thinks much of any of my comics collection. <laughs> Pretty pretty ridiculous. That's almost the Steven Seagal movie. The uh, is it hard to kill? I think Mark for death. One of them ends up with a, a guy with a gun in his mouth as the big climax. Look at that face. That's wow. some damage. Wow, that's fun. Claw slash to the face. I thought that pinup was a good one. 
Um, this is Fanico, another one of those companies, a uh, small indie company that we've talked about. Fanico did Girl Squad X and Gore Shriek. I don't know why this was on my list, but I like the guy's art, but I'm not really sure how it ended up on my list. A lot of this stuff is just so random, you know, like if they have it for a dollar, it's like pick it up. And then this was totally random. I had never heard of it before. This was like the big surprise comic to come out of the uh, that that morning. Little Fat Albert uh, homage, possibly. Looks like and it. also, whenever I dig in the quarter bins and such, uh, and and go back and I put my my box in order, the dark, yeah, the D section is pretty robust always. Yes. As far as I can tell, this is supposed to be issue one of four. I think this is the only issue. Big surprise. And it's Travos PA. I don't know where that is. I've never heard of that before. Maybe around Philadelphia or something. Nineteen ninety five. Um, you know, clearly your self-published kind of thing. That's awesome. Yeah, it looks, it, it's not bad looking. Um, I think her outfit might be impractical for fighting crime and like holding onto the side of a car. What superhero hero lady's uh, outfit isn't? That's true. That That is uh, very, very true. Anyway, I think it looks pretty good, but I love the cover and it's definitely something that I uh, have never heard of before. I think that's a lift from a Bisley piece, Maximum Force. That character's pretty fun design. Looks like he could be in Savage Dragon. Good haul, man. Yeah, pretty happy with, with that. Jimmy, man, we got business, so we yes. better get the heck out of here. k Fevers, like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll let you know when those next vids are available. We are on a race to 15,000, so make that happen. Sign up for our e-newsletter at the link below this video. Pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merch and t-shirts at the links below this video. We got to go uh, change our setup immediately, Jimmy. Uh, give them those marching orders. Read more comics.